We're going to take a look at something called curve sketching today. Now this is generally a fairly hard topic because this is going to put together everything we've ever learned in math ever all into one idea. In fact, as I kind of step to the side, we're going to take a look at a function and we're going to try to find all this stuff about it and maybe some more stuff depending on the example. We're going to look for x-intercepts, y-intercepts, horizontal asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, maxes, mins, where it's increasing, decreasing, where it's concave up, where it's concave down, and if it has any points of inflection. So these problems are generally extremely long problems because we're looking for a lot of stuff. Now, <clears throat> you want to kind of categorize these into different uh, parts of the problem, though, as you work through. Now, I'm going to erase this here in a second, but these first things we normally look for, these come from the function itself. Right? That's the function given. We find x-intercepts, y-intercepts, all that kind of stuff. The next things we look for, maxes or mins, increasing, decreasing, all come from the first derivative. And concavity and points of uh, inflection come from the second derivative. So that's kind of how we're going to classify these problems. We're going to start working with the function until we find everything about that. Then we're going to take our first derivative, find everything we can from our first derivative, then take the second derivative, find everything we can from that. So let's start with uh, <coughs> an example here. Well, I'm going to take a couple of boards to do all this, and then we'll see if we're going to put it together into one sketch. So let's say we have two, <coughs> let's do two x cubed, uh, let's do minus three x squared, minus 36x plus 54. 54 will work. All right, so uh, we got a lot of work to do. There's our original function. So let's start by just finding all the pieces. So from olden times, we know to find x-intercepts, we let y be equal to zero and solve. x cubed minus three x squared minus 36x plus 54. Well, this is a polynomial equation. We try to move everything to one side, that's done, and try to factor. Now, if this doesn't factor, you're gonna to have to fall back on some of your old methods like um, uh, the rational zeros test so you can do synthetic division. But lucky for us, I believe this factors. And we can grab the first pair and the second pair. Uh, the first pair of the greatest common factor is an x squared, and I'm left with two x minus three. Out of the second pair, uh, 18, right? Which gives me 2x minus 3. All right, I have uh, two terms. They both have the 2x minus 3. I can factor that out front. Open up some parentheses from this first term. I have left an x squared if I take out the 2x minus 3. Minus from the second pair, I have an 18. All right, two things multiplied together and equal and 0. One of those has to be a 0. Uh, so I get x squared minus 18 is equal to 0. So we get uh, 2x equals 3, x is equal to 3 halves, x squared is equal to 18, so x is equal to plus or minus square root of 18. Anytime we put a radical into a problem, you always want to simplify it as soon as you can. There is a perfect square in 18, right? Uh, 18 is, that's not the right marker, 18 is 2 times 9. Right, so I don't know what the square root of two is, so that stays underneath, but the three comes out. <clears throat> so that'll be x is equal to plus or minus three square roots of two. All right, so in this case, I have one, two, three x-intercepts. So <clears throat> let me come back over here. We're gonna try to gather all our information in one spot here. So the x-intercept is uh, <clears throat> three halves zero, 3 square roots of 2, 0, and negative 3 square roots of 2, 0. Okay, y-intercepts, that's always a little bit easier. Actually, a lot of bit easier. y-intercepts, we let x be equal to 0. So that's going to be 2, 0 cubed, 3, 0 squares, 36 zeros, and then 54. So that's just 54. So our y-intercept is the point <coughs> 0, 54. <coughs> All right, horizontal asymptotes. Remember from our past, horizontal asymptotes 
occur anywhere that the denominator is undefined, but the numerator is not, or anywhere the bottom is equal to zero, but the top's not. So since we don't have a fraction here, we don't have, I'm sorry, uh, that's vertical axis, that's like a lot of work. Uh, vertical axis helps occur anywhere the bottom is equal to zero, but not the top. We don't have a fraction, so we don't have any vertical asymptotes. I'm sorry, I read them out of order. Uh, horizontal asymptotes. Now, we've seen this in a previous video. So here I'm just going to say vertical asymptotes. None. For horizontal asymptotes, we need to take this and we need to do the limit as x goes to positive infinity of 2x cubed minus 3x squared 36x plus 54. So we know that as we head out towards an infinity, all those lower terms aren't going to matter. So what happens to this expression as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Now x is positive, so 2 times a positive cubed is still a positive. And of course, infinity cubed is infinity, so that's going towards a positive infinity. If we do the limit as x goes to negative infinity, 2x cubed, 3x squared, 36x plus 54. Same thing happens. The difference here is, uh, as we go to negative infinity, well, that's 2 times a negative cubed. Negative times a negative times a negative is still a negative. Uh, so infinity cubed is infinity, but this is going to negative infinity. Now, we don't have any horizontal asymptotes. We don't have any, but we do know something about the end behavior. So here for horizontal asymptotes, I'm going to put none, but what do we know about what's happening to the ends? As we go to positive infinity, it's going to positive infinity. So as we go to the right, it's going up. As we go to the left towards negative infinity, it's going down. So this isn't part of the actual horizontal asymptotes, but I know my graph should be doing something like that at the end. Okay, that's everything we get from the function. So I need some room, so let's go ahead and get rid of this and switch on over to our first derivative and see what we can come up with. <coughs> okay, for our first derivative, let's go ahead and do this, that's gonna be six x squared minus six x minus 36. Remember, for our first derivative test, we want to know where that's equal to zero and is undefined. Now, so again, since we don't have a fraction here, this is never undefined. So we don't get any values from this. This will be equal to zero when 6x squared minus 6x minus 36 is equal to zero. We have a greatest common factor. We can factor that some more. That's x minus 3x plus 2. Three things multiply together, one of those has to be a zero. Well, a six can't be a zero, besides that didn't tell me anything about x's either. So we get x is equal to three and x is equal to negative two. So we have two values that we need to put on our number line. So what was it? It was a negative two and a positive three. And we're going to pick values on our number uh, line around those. So, so let's say negative 3, 0 would be easy, and 4. So for each one of those, remember, we're plugging it into our first derivative only to see if it's positive or negative. Now you can plug it in here, but as I told you before, you can use the factored form as long as you didn't divide anything out. Like if we had divided the 6 out here, you may not get the right answers if you do something like that. But I can use this. Watch, why would I want to use this? Because this is pretty easy to use. Watch, if I plug a negative three, I'm throwing stuff. I plug a negative three into this expression. Well, the six is always positive. Negative three minus three is negative. Negative three plus two is negative. Positive times a negative times a negative is actually a positive, which means over here it is increasing. Now notice I didn't actually care what value I had there. I'm only worried about positive or negative. So let's do it for the zero. Six is positive. If I plug zero into there, that's going to be negative. If I plug zero into there, that's going to be positive. Positive times negative times positive is negative. So here it is decreasing. All right, let's plug four in there. Well, six always positive. 
That would be positive and positive. All positives multiply to give you a positive. All right, so if we take a look at what's happening here in negative two, this might be a maximum, right? Because it goes from increasing to decreasing. So that we need to check to see if that's a maximum. And it looks like right here, that might be a minimum, right? Because it goes from decreasing to increasing. So how do we check to see if they're actually maximums or minimums? Well, we've got to plug them into the original function and check. Um, so let's see. It's going to be a lot of arithmetic here. It's negative 2 cubed. It's 3 times negative 2 squared minus 36 times negative 2 plus 54. <coughs> All right, so this is going to be 2 times negative 8. Negative 3 times 4, 72 plus 54. This is negative 24 minus 12 plus 72 plus 54. So that's negative 36, 72, and 54. What's that going to give me? That's uh, 36 plus 54 is, that's 80, 90? That doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. 3, 12. Positive 72, 36. All right, let's put it in there. I don't believe the number's right. Go check that. There's a real good chance I think that's wrong. That didn't feel right. I feel like I did some arithmetic wrong. All right, we plug three into there. We're gonna end up with a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, you can do this. What I mean by do this is, I know if I plug a three in everywhere there's a two, I'm gonna get a number out. So I know right now, even though I don't know what it actually is, I know there is a minimum value. That, that is a minimum. I'm gonna go ahead and take this and uh, try to do some more arithmetic, and apparently I'm gonna do it wrong today, but let's give it a shot. Uh, what are we plugging in? We're plugging in three here. Um, let's see, so it's gonna be two times 27 minus three times nine minus, what's 36 times three? That's eight, one, uh, <coughs> 108 plus 54. Okay, so this is 54 minus 27 minus 108 plus 54. Uh, 27, 27 minus 108 plus 54. That's half, so I'm gonna go 27 minus 54 is negative 27. Well, that felt better. I think the negative 27 is feels right. I don't know, something about that negative two doesn't feel right. All right, but we're going to keep it up there, even though I'm pretty sure that's the wrong number. So let's put in what we know now. We know we have a maximum at negative two comma, don't think it's 90. We have a minimum at three negative 27. <clears throat> okay, what about increasing? That's next, right? Increasing, we're increasing from negative infinity to negative two, and from three to infinity. So we go from negative infinity to negative two, and from three to infinity. And the only place that we're decreasing is from negative two to three. So negative two to three. All right, well that finishes up for our first derivative. So let's go ahead and uh, get all of our scratch work out of here for that. And since I go ahead and need the second derivative, I'll let this part up here. So we get the second derivative would be what? 12x minus 6. All right, we did the same thing with our, or with our second derivative we do with our first. We want to know uh, where it's equal to 0 and undefined. So our 12x minus 6 is 0. Again, for this example, this is never undefined. <coughs> so we get 12x is equal to 6 divided by 12. So we get x is a half. That's going to be fun to plug in. All right, so we put that on our number line. There's our one half. We pick a number on each side, let's say zero and one. And we're going to plug it into our uh, second derivative, see if it is positive or negative. Well, if I plug zero in for that, it says 12 times zero, zero minus six is negative, so that's concave down. If I plug one into there, that's 12 minus six, that's positive, so that's concave up. 
So it does look like I have a point of inflection at the point one half comma uh, something. <clears throat> so how do I figure out if it's actually a point of inflection? Well, we have to plug it in. So this would be two times one half cubed minus three times one half squared, 36 halves plus 54. That equals something. I think it's, uh, I'm gonna guess here, 71 halves. You wonder, I've done this problem before, that's why I'm pretty sure that that's wrong. That doesn't feel right. <clears throat> I think 71 halves is right. So which means that this actually is a point of inflection because we got a value out of there. And even if I didn't know what this number was, I know it's a point of inflection because I know I'll plug a half in there, it's gonna give me a number out. I may not know exactly what number it is, <coughs> excuse me, but I do know it'll give me a number. So one half, 71 halves. Okay, so from our picture, this thing is concave up, one half to infinity, right? That's over here concave up over here, concave down over there. So this would be negative infinity to one half. All right, <coughs> we finished our table. Grab another Richard. We got a ton of information. Now let's see if we can put all of this together in a picture. Let's see. Now we've got some really big numbers here, so I'm going to tend not to label this too much as we do it, but we can do a little bit. So let's start with the actual points on the graph that we know. We have x-intercepts at 3 half 0, so that's about 1 and a half, so... So about 1 and a half, 0. And then we got this 3 squared to 2. Remember, that's the square root of 18 is where we got that. That's really close to the square root of 16, right? So it's a little bit bigger than the square root of 16, which means this is just a little bit bigger than 4. So we go 4 this way gives us 1, and 4 this way gives us another, right? Because we have both a positive and a negative. So there's our three x-intercepts. <coughs> we have a y-intercept at 0, 54, so... Uh, up here at 54, notice I just kind of put it up there, 4. Okay, uh, we don't have any horizontal asymptotes, we don't have any vertical asymptotes, but we did get some end behavior, which means I know over here it should be going down and over there it should be going up. Right, that was kind of the end behavior we got from our, our limits. We have a maximum at negative 290. Wow, it's a big number, whatever it is, so... I'm going to put 90 up here. Again, I think that number is wrong. So negative 290, that's a maximum. Now, here's an easy way to kind of visually see that. Since that's a maximum, I know it's the top of something. So I'm going to put a little dome right there. I know I have a minimum at 3, negative 27. So at 3, down here and say negative 27, I have a minimum. So I'm going to put a little dome like that. Uh, any other points that I know? Yeah, I know a point of inflection at a half, 71 halves. That's about 35 and a half. So somewhere right here, I'm going to go 71 halves. And at a half, right about there, it's a point of inflection, which means I need to change my concavity. So now let's see if we can put all of our intervals together. We know uh, this thing should be increasing from negative infinity to negative 2. So on this over here, we should be going up. And that should make sense because we should be going down out of here and we got to get to there through this spot. So we're going to kind of, I know this is going to be a really messy graph. There we go. We're increasing on that side. I go through my x-intercept. I'm increasing until I get to that maximum. <coughs> then I'm decreasing from negative two to three. So I'm decreasing from this x value to this x value, so basically from here to here. But what else has to happen here? Well, we got some concavity, right? We need to be concave down on this side. So watch, I know I gotta go through all, I gotta go through that point, that point, that point, that point to get to there. Now I gotta be concave down, it's gonna be hard to do the way I'm doing this. Kinda concave down when I get there. All right, so see how it overall has a concave down. 
But on this side over here, I gotta be concave up. So the rest of this, I wanna be kind of drawing more of an upward thing. So I'm decreasing, so I got to here. So, so we're concave down, then kind of kind of looks like it's concave up. And that's our decreasing, and then we know we're increasing from where am I at? Three to infinity. So I'm increasing all the way out, which makes sense because I gotta get here. I know I'm heading out. I have one more x intercept, and we kind of head out of there. All right, there is a super crappy graph of our original function, but it does have all the important points on it. It has all of our x-intercepts, y-intercepts. It shows us exactly where the maximum or mins are. One of them's wrong, apparently. <coughs> it shows us where it's concave up, where it's concave down, where it's increasing, decreasing, and even where the concavity changes at. <coughs> all right, curve sketching, these problems are gonna take you a long time because there's a lot of work that goes into it, but it does show how much you understand from all the material that we've covered so far.